in the name of God hello everybody this is the first session of your morphology lesson uh, in this session I want to talk about the morphology and the uh, uh, analysis related to the morphology so uh, the name of the first chapter is thinking about morphology and morphological analysis uh, first uh, what is morphology? The term morphology is generally attributed to the German poet and novelist uh, Wolfgang von Goethe, uh, uh, who coined it early in the 19th century in a biological context. Its etymology, the etymology of morphology, uh, is Greek. Morph means shape and form, and morphology is the study of form and for for example in biology morphology refers to uh, the study of the form and the structure of organism and for example in geology it refers to the study of the configuration of the land forms in linguistics morphology refers to the mental system involved in word formation or to the branch of linguistics that deal with words, their internal structure, and how they are formed. So the morphology, I mean, is a branch of linguistic which study the, uh, I mean, the words and the internal structure of the words. So this is the definition of, I mean, morphology. But what is morphemes? Uh, morpheme. A major way in which morphologists investigate words, I mean the internal structure and how they are formed, is through the identification and study of morphemes, often defined as the smallest linguistic pieces with a grammatical function. So this definition is not meant to include all morphemes but it is the usual one and a good starting point a morpheme may consist of a word just one word like word for example hand and this is one morpheme or a meaningful piece of a word such as for example ed this suffix in look you see this is a kind of again morpheme uh, or a meaningful, uh, uh, for example, this one. Uh, so this one, this morpheme, this ed or hand, cannot be divided into smaller meaningful parts. Another way in which morphemes have been defined is as a pairing between sound and meaning. We have purposely chosen not to use this definition. Some morphemes have not, for example, concrete form or no continuous form as uh, we will see in the next uh, in the uh, chapters and some do not have meanings in the conventional sense of the term so you may also run across the term morph so this is morpheme but what is morph the term morph is uh, sometimes used to refer specifically to the phonological realization of a morpheme for example the English past tense morpheme that we spell ed, okay, here this is a kind of, I mean, morpheme, has various morphs. Uh, it is realized as t after, for example, voiceless p, uh, uh, for example, jumped, or um, so we spell it d after, for example, voiced l, like repelled or we spell it ed after for example uh, the voiceless t of the root or the voice de of for example rooted you see or wedded you see here so we can also call these morph uh, uh, each of these i mean the spelling is one morph we call these uh, uh, different morphs as allomorphs or variant. Okay, we call them allomorphs of the, I mean the past suffix in English. So, uh, or we can uh, the appearance of one morph over another in this case uh, is determined by voicing and the place of articulation of the final consonant of the verb stem. For example, if it is voiceless, we call it te, 
or if it is voiced, we call de and some other alam morphs. Now consider the word, for example, reconsideration. Look at this example, reconsideration. So uh, we can break it into three morphemes, re, consider, and asian. Consider is called the stem. Consider is the stem of this word. A stem is a base unit to which another morphological piece is attached. The stem can be simple, made up of only one part, or complex, uh, uh, it's made up of more than one piece. For example, here, uh, consider is a simple, here, consider is a simple a stem. Although uh, maybe it consists, uh, we have some other, I mean, um, uh, base or roots which is complex. Um, we could also uh, con uh, call consider the root. A root is like a stem in uh, constituting the core of the word to which other pieces attach, but the term refers only to morphologically simple units. For example, disagree is the stem of disagreement, okay? We can add the suffix meant to this, uh, I mean, stem, and you produce another word, disagreement, because it is the base to which meant attaches. But agree is the root, not disagree. So disagree is the base to attach, uh, I mean, meant to it, but the root of disagreement is just agree, not disagree. So this is the root. Uh, agree is, we can call it the agree is both the stem to which this attach and the root of entire word. So this is the, I mean, difference between the root and the stem. Uh, returning now again to the word reconsideration, look at it. Re and Asian are both affixes which means that they are attached to the stem. Affixes, for example, like re, that go before the stem are prefixes, and those like Asian that go after are suffixes. Uh, so some readers may, uh, um, so uh, it is important, excuse me, to take seriously the idea that the grammatical function of a morpheme which may include its meaning, must be constant. Consider, for example, the English words lovely and quickly. Look at these two examples. Lovely and quickly. They both end with the suffix ly, you see. But is it the same in both words? No. When we add ly to the adjective quick, we create an adverb that is often synonymous with, for example, rapidly. The students quickly assimilated the concept, for example. When we add ly to the noun love, we create an adjective lovely. Okay, what a lovely day. So, what on the surface appears to be a single morpheme turns out to be two. One attaches to adjectives and create adverbs. The other attaches to noun and create adjectives. So these two kind of ly, I mean, are different from each other. This ly produce a kind of adjective attached to the noun, and this ly produce a kind of adverb attaches to the adjective and produce adverb. So they are different from each other. There are two other sorts of affixes that you will encounter. The two, I mean, is prefix and suffix. The other two one is infixes and circumfixes. Both are classic challenges to the notion of morpheme. Infixes are segmental strings that do not attach to the front or back of the word, but rather somewhere in the middle. Okay, some languages like, for example, uh, Tagal languages have some kind of infixes, which is, I mean, attaches to the middle of the word. Circumfixes are affixes that comes in two parts. One attaches to the front of the word and the other to the uh, back of the word. So this is the circumfix. So we have four kind of 
affixes prefix which is attaches uh, in I mean the before of the word suffixes which attach at the end of the word infixes which attach in the middle of the word and second from second fixes which uh, I mean divided to two parts one part attached to the first part of the word and the other attached to the end of the word this is four kind of I mean uh, affixes which we can talk about it in languages so this is the I mean affixes uh, the other part of this chapter which talk about uh, morphology in action and talk about the novel words and words play if uh, for example uh, uh, the morphology in action we would like to explore the idea of morphology more deeply by examining some data these are example of morphology in action morphology facts of everyday life we have some novel words in everyday life if you had walking down for example uh, the street uh, in New York several years ago you might have looked up and seen a sign for the music store for example Rebop okay the music so which uh, its name is Rebop a name that owes its inspiration inspiration to jazz term Rebop for example this is a new word uh, in jazz music I mean stories so names of um, uh, um, uh, stores and for example products are designed to catch the consumers attention so not necessarily to make sense and this one does not I mean does so by exploiting people's knowledge of English in a fairly complex way and breaking the rules so as to attract attention as verbal or often does consider now for example the following phrase taken from a Tony Braxton song on break my heart on cry these tears we have never seen anyone for example on break someone and you certainly cannot on cry tears but every English speaker can understand these words we all know what it means to unbreak somebody's for example heart or to wish that one's heart were unbroken if you ask somebody unbreak my heart we would be asking them to reverse the process of having our heart broken uh, we can visualize on cry these tears too think of a film for example running backward we can understand these words because we uh, 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 know the meaning of on the prefix on which when attached to a verb reverse or undoes an action so the fact that these particular actions breaking a heart and crying tears cannot be reversed only adds uh, the sadness to the song okay so all human beings have this capacity for generating and understanding novel words they are novel words okay so uh, sometimes someone creates an entirely new word as for example uh, uh, some uh, for example Tolkien did when he coined the now familiar term Hobbit but more often than not uh, uh, we build new words from pre-existing I mean pieces as with for example on break because we have on and break in our language and we produce a new word from pre-existing pieces or an, on cry or as with for example hobbitish built by adding suffix to the stem hobbit we could easily go on to create more words on these patterns so all uh, novel words are all around us in our I mean life uh, these are everyday morphological facts which uh, I mean the, the kind you run across every day as a literate speaker of English so uh, uh, when we saw for example or heard these new words for the first time they leaped out at us okay they attract our attention I mean it is interesting that novel words do this to us because novel sentences generally do not okay I mean the novel sentences 
cannot uh, attract our attention but the novel words can uh, I mean do it uh, so um, for example uh, you generally for example do not realize that the new sentence for example it is the first time that you have heard it and you do not say to yourself what a for example remarkable sentence unless it happens to be one from for example uh, some famous f for example poet uh, or some other uh, artist many people have made the observation before that morphology differs from syntax in this way i mean the novel words can attract our attention but the novel sentences cannot attract our attention this is the difference between morphology and syntax in this view uh, so in this part i want to talk about the abstract morphological facts some facts in morphology which are abstract in uh, languages for example in English language or some other languages so let's move to some more abstract morphological facts these are the kind of morphological facts that you do not notice every day they are so embedded in your language that you do not even think about them they are more common than the ones we have just looked at but deeper and more complex if you speak for example English and are concerned about your health you might say for example I eat one melon a day okay let's imagine that we are even more concerned about our health than you are we don't just eat one melon a day rather we eat two melons a day it is a fact about standard American or Britain Britain I mean British English that we cannot say for example uh, we we cannot say for example we eat two melon and we do not spell s here a day this is on grammatical however if we were for example speak indonesian or japanese we would say the equivalent of two melon or three or four melon because these languages do not use morphological plural in sentences like this for example in Indonesian language we say I eat two melon not melons every day because this language do not have I mean morphological plurals but English has this morphological plural so uh, we should say I eat two melons not melon because it is ungrammatical in English language this is the difference between language this is a parameter uh, which uh, show the differences between languages so the morphological grammar of English tells us that we have to put an s on melon so whenever we are talking about more than one this fact of English is so transparent that native speakers do not notice it because it is obvious if we happen uh, to be speakers of a language without obligatory plural marking like Japanese or Indonesian however we will notice and may have trouble with it so we have now observed something about English morphology if a word is plural it takes the suffix s uh, living creatures do not eat only melons however for example look at this example the evil example number six giant at the top of the beanstalk eats two melons three fish and four children a day you see here everyone agrees that fish is plural even though there is no plural marker children is also plural but it has a very unusual plural suffix ren plus an internal change we say child instead of child okay children we do not always mark plural words with an s like thing there are other ways in which we can make plurals for example native speakers of english know this and they do not need to think about it before making a plural consider exa example number seven for example today 
they claim that they will fix the clock tower by Friday, but yesterday they claimed that it would take at least a month. In this example, we use two different forms of the verb claim. One is present tense, you see here, and the other is past tense. Again, this is not true for all languages. If we were speaking, uh, for example, the other language, like uh, uh, I think the Chinese language, if we were speaking Chinese, we would not distinguish between claim and claimed in a sentence like uh, this one. For example, look at example number eight. Uh, because the adverb yesterday is sufficient to indicate past tense. Look at the Chinese example. Today, they say the, they Friday can fix well clock tower, but yesterday. Okay, so the, uh, the, I mean the verbs in Chinese uh, in the present tense and past tense I mean, are not different from each other because we use a uh, I mean adverb yesterday to show the uh, past tense and uh, this is sufficient for showing the past tense and we do not I mean use the uh, uh, suffix for showing the uh, past tense for example ed like English language but in English language we should use it to show the I mean past tense so if we were uh, if uh, notice what happens in English when uh, we use some other for example uh, verbs beside claim today they say but yesterday they said today they tell us but yesterday they told us today they know but yesterday they knew that these verbs another do not add te, de, or ed to make their past tense in an elementary fact about English morphology will uh, uh, the next observation about English so this is uh, again uh, another form of the past tense in English uh, we I mean uh, we do not use ed um, um, after all verbs in English to showing the past tense some uh, some I mean verbs are irregular so we use for example tell told now new here so this is again the uh, grammatical forms in English the next observation about English morphology has to do with pronouns here is uh, an exchange between an American mother who has just watched a billiard ball break through a window and her six-year-old boy who is standing inside. Example number 10. Okay, for example, I read it to you. Who just threw a ball, a pool ball, through the basement window? And the child said, not me. In this context, a six-year-old wouldn't respond, not I, through... Uh, though, if he were to answer with a sentence like the response would be I didn't, not me didn't, without formally knowing anything at all about subjects and objects, English speaking six year olds, I mean, and children even younger, master the pronoun system of the spoken language in uh, English. Uh, given the following sentence, how many children does John have? Okay, look at the answer. All of John's children are brilliant and play musical instrument surpassingly well. From this statement, you cannot know how many children John has, but one thing is certain. She has more than two. If John had only two children, he would normally say both of John's children, because it is a fact about English that there is a morphological distinction among I mean universal quantifiers between the one distinguishing uh, I mean designating all of two both or all of more than two all of a particular type of entity in some other languages uh, marking for dual is even more pervasive this is the case in ancient Greek 
like Arabic. Arabic has dual, I mean, uh, 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 dual number. Uh, I mean, a form which showing the dual number, you know. But English, I mean, doesn't have this one. Uh, so while English does not have a special affixes to mark the dual, it keeps track of the distinguished. Uh, distinction through words like all and both English use these quantifiers to show both and more than both I mean all there are even languages in the world like manum in uh, 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 some other languages uh, which uh, that distinguish not only singular dual and plural but also trial I mean three uh, one so the use of uh, singular, dual, trial, and plural, uh, I mean, we use it in some other languages. So languages are different from each other in this, I mean, respect. Some languages show just, uh, for example, uh, the singular and the plural, like the English language. Some other languages use not only singular, plural, but dual to showing two, I mean, person or two uh, persons or two uh, two things, and some other languages not only use singular, plural, dual, but trial. I mean, three things or uh, three uh, persons. So this is again the differences between languages in showing, uh, I mean, numbers. So uh, these are the facts. I mean about the. Uh, English language and some other languages which are abstract morphological facts and uh, as a native speaker we do not I mean think about these facts just we use them uh, without I mean thinking about them but as you see there are differences between languages in these morphological um, facts Okay, uh, I think it's enough for today. Uh, in this session, uh, I uh, talk about the um, uh, morphology, what is morphology, what is morphemes, uh, what is morph, and uh, then we talk about some morphological, I mean, the new words, how we create the new words in our languages. And then uh, at last part, I talk about the some uh, morphological, um, I mean facts, abstract morphological facts, which we have in our languages, and we use them without uh, thinking about uh, them, and we see the awesome differences between languages in these morphological uh, facts. Okay, mm, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, goodbye everybody.